Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 19, we're going to take a look at my prototype 6 or 12 SN7 line preamp. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Back in tube lab number 10, we took a first look at the 6SN7. After the 12AU7 and 12AX7, probably the most common triode in use today. If you want to know the different variations and important specifications to be aware of, have a look at tube lab number 10. I'll put a link below. Okay, what's a line preamp? It's exactly what it says. It takes low voltage inputs, say from a phono preamp or a CD player, and it increases and controls that AC signal to an appropriate level for the power amp. Now I can hear all kinds of questions. Y'all are nuts! Why bother with 12 SN7s when there are gazillions of 6 SN7s out there? And besides, the 6 SN7 is just an okay preamp tube. Plenty of super rare, cost a bazillion dollar tubes that sound better. And last but not least, how in the heck is it even possible to run two different heater voltages? Well, we're going to try to answer those questions. But, if you watched a few tube labs, you know one of my favorite things to do is finding ways to get you into tubes affordably. So in case you haven't noticed, the price of vintage tubes has gone crazy in the last year. But many 12 volt octals are still reasonable and some really beautiful tubes are available and mostly affordable. And lastly, the 6 or 12 SN7 just has a lovely warm tube sound that is unique to this universal twin triode. Let's dive in and see how this thing can easily run both 6SN7s and 12SN7s. And as always, let's start with a pinout sheet and a data sheet. This is from Blue Glow's website. And you've seen me use this before. Here's the pinout for the 6SN7. It's also the pinout for the 12SN7. And the higher output version of the 6SN7, the 6SL7. In fact, back in the day, before the 12AX7 came along, if you wanted a higher gain tube, in this case, Samity, an MU or gain of Samity, you would use the 6SL7. And there's a 12 volt version as well. The important thing to see here is that the electrical pinout or the electrical connections are exactly the same for all these tubes. Doesn't matter what the heater voltage is. The heater comes on to 7 and 8, and it's not like a 12AX7, which can run at 6 volts, it can run at 12 volts, you can series string them, you can do all kinds of neat stuff. You need to bring 6.3 to 7 and 8, or 12.6 to 7 and 8. It can be AC or DC. I happen to prefer DC on preamps. I find that we get less noise. But a well-engineered um, AC um, heater connection will work just fine as well. Okay. Look at what we've got here. We've got an original Slovenia data sheet. And it covers the 6SN7 GTA, the GTB. Oh, look at that. There's. Can you see that? There's an 8SN7, and it covers the 12SN7 GTA. So it always starts with the heater. Nothing happens unless the heater fires up. So that's the first design consideration for our tube. So the 6.3 volt version has 600, a draw of 600 milliamps on the heater. And we're not too concerned about the 8.4. But we are about the 12.6. It draws 300 milliamps. So, double the voltage, have the current. And that's a good thing, folks. Lower current is actually a good thing. 
and let's take a look here. These are your operating maximums and look at them. They're exactly the same for all these tube types. These tubes are all the same with the exception of the heater voltage. There will be some small variations I believe in sound. I think there actually be some improvements in operating um, conditions at 12.6 volts, but basically they're all the same tube. Okay, let's put that aside. Let's get into this puppy. Now, what you've got here is a right channel and a left channel. In fact, this is a, let's get under the hood, this is a dual mono design. So basically we have two preamplifiers in one chassis. Not that common, though in high-end gear it is. And this is affordable stuff. Let's just get this turned around for you. Let's show you the volume is over here on the front. This is cherry wood, by the way. And years ago when I had a fine cabinet shop, this was my favorite wood. It still is my favorite wood. It's unfinished. It's only actually been in the system for a week. But I love it already. Now, why go to the trouble of building a dual model system? Well, back when it was time to upgrade my phono preamp at Christmas, I thought I'd like to try to improve the sound stage and the stereo separation. And I've always wanted to try a dual mono design. Now, obviously, many of us have mono block amplifiers, the power amplifiers. So those are completely independent. You've got a left one, a right one. But many preamps will use one power supply. So what happened back with the photo preamp prototype is I was floored. I was absolutely floored. And I listened to a lot of good, high-quality music. And I couldn't believe the improvement in soundstage. So where instruments and voices are placed, in the level of detail, as well. It was just, I'm, I'm just speechless. I just, I thought there would be a small difference, but there is a huge difference. Stereo separation in particular was just amazing. But the detail level improved as well. And what I think happens when we're running two channels on top of each other, which is normal for um, preamplifiers, is that we're seeing some interchannel distortion. And as a result, we're masking some of the details. The music still sounds fantastic. The tubes sound warm and wonderful, but the level of detail that's missing is just not, you don't know it's there. Unless you've been to a friend system that's highly resolving, or if you experienced that in a music room back in the day when there were music rooms in high-end stereo stores, you just don't know that that track has that level of detail until you unveil it. And that's what a dual mono design helps. Okay, so the heart of this is an r -core transformer. It's a universal transformer, so it'll take North American voltages, 115 to 120, and it'll take European voltages of 220 to 230 volts AC. But what makes this a really interesting and unique transformer is that it's got a dual secondary. So it's got 220 at 34 milliamps times 2 on the secondary. And of course, we've got two prime primary filter caps, two two chokes. Let's just look at how it functions quickly. I don't want to make this video too long. We've got a pair of RCA inputs on a double pole double throw switch with a center off, which is handy because if you want to clean your stylus you just drop that into the center position and that'll shut off the input. So we'll just drop, you just drop the switch in the right direction. That's the way it's wired and that makes life easy. We'll see how it's wired in a minute. We've got a switch here that is another version of this switch. So basically it's an on-on switch with a center off. And it takes the, the um, power brick or 
SMPS, or Switch Mode Power Supply. And that's the secret of how these things work. I've got one lying around here somewhere. So 12 volts are very common. You can even find them used for very reasonable prices. And I've talked about this one before. This is a 7 volt unit, so it needs a small dropping resistor to get you down to 6.3 volts. In this case, we'll look at that in a minute, but in this case it's half an ohm. I'm running a 5 watt, which is a bit overkill. But anyways, um, so all you do is you plug in the correct voltage. I've labeled it. It might be a little hard to see, but in this case, forward is running 6 volts and back is running 12 volts. Okay. Now obviously if you have the 12, 12 volt power block or brick connected up, you do not want to have a 6 volt tube in. So what I've done is I've actually put little labels on these just to make sure I don't mix them up. Okay, let's put that away. And we just have a pair of RCAs going out. So let's flip it over. Let's take a quick look. Let's zoom in a bit. So here's our AC coming in. It goes into the transformer, of course. Here's the secondary coming out. It goes into a pair of fuses. There's our first filter cap. We have four diodes arranged in a full bridge. Remember this is not a center tap transformer, so we have a full bridge. Now because this is a prototype and I got tired of resoldering joints, you'll notice that I've got a unique kind of fastening system. We use these back when I was into offshore sailing, I did a lot of DC wiring and we did a lot of DC wiring with mechanical fasteners. So I got really comfortable. And then later on, I lived off the grid and with um, solar uh, voltaics and wind energy, you do a lot of mechanical fastening of big wires. You don't do any soldering. You just screw those suckers down tight with uh, universal connectors. So I came up with this method it's probably not to any code in the world. It works perfectly for a prototype. Don't copy it or we'll both get into trouble. Basically, I just take a, a 12 or a 3 mil, 12 or 14 mil bolt. I put an appropriate 3 mil hole through my little prototype board and I put, I put one of these flange nuts underneath facing up. So I have a nice little clamp and then I put one on top and it works perfectly. And you can take this thing apart, and put it back together. Okay, let's just run through this quickly. So here we have a dropping resistor that gets our B plus to what we want, which is about 250 volts DC. Here we have a bleed resistor. Let's zoom in a little bit more. That's a 47K. What that does is it takes off any voltage that after you turn off your amps, these filter caps are fairly large. In fact, before you go diving into any equipment, even ones that have bleed resistors on them, this is a discharge tool. Blue Glow actually has a video on how to make it. It's just got a big honking resistor in here. And basically, you short out the capacitor. So you come in on the B+, start on the ground, come in on the B+, hold it there for a couple of seconds, and you'll get a spark if there is uh, power remaining in the capacitors. And that a couple of seconds, it's drained down. A couple of seconds, you know it's safe. Now, good designs, in my opinion, are going to have this bleed resistor. This 47K doesn't draw a lot of energy off of the B+. It just trickles a tiny bit while you're operating. And I designed these so that They'll drop the B plus from 250 volts DC to 12 volts DC in 60 seconds. That's my design specifications, and it's almost bang on. So here you'll see a little, let's see if you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. So here is the connection for the power brick switch mode power supply. Here's the little dropping resistor. This is on the 6 volt side. The 12 volt side doesn't need anything because the um, 
those little power bricks come in right at 12 volts, which is for 12.6, 12 is fine. That's actually, a, that's a good heater voltage to be running. What you don't want to be is too high. Okay. And here you'll notice I've got these what look like prototype boards. And actually I've been carrying them in the store for quite a while. I brought them in because I thought, geez, those are really neat. Where have I, I've got some here. And what they are is a nice heavy fiberglass and they're designed, they're a universal socket board. So they'll take a seven pin, an eight pin octal or a nine pin miniature like a 12AX7. And if you want, you can solder directly onto the output tabs, or you can put these really neat mechanical connectors on, or as you can see here, I use them in some places and not in other places. Some places I don't need a connection because it's jumped from one side. Anyways, I really enjoyed building with these and um, I think they do a good job. For a prototype they're fabulous because if I want to modify the board or even try something out on one channel even, I can just disconnect it quickly. Let's just move it over there. Do the work on the bench, put it back in, or if I want to really change the circuit quite a bit I can just build a brand new board and leave everything else the same. Maybe the dropping resistor has to change. So I'm in love with these things. I think they're really great. They're sturdy enough that uh, when you plug the tube in, there's no flexing, which is great. So let's look at this rat's nest over here. This is the RCA in. Look at all these wires. And then it comes down to a left and a right into the Alps pot. You can see it down there, the blue guy. They're lovely, lovely volume controls, nice and quiet, very reliable. Now you may notice a big mistake. I reused this whole section from a, a, an earlier build. I love recycling. And red for right seemed fine and white for left is fine. So I just put everything in place. But look what happens here. Red for B plus on my designs and black for ground. That is perfectly good. But look what I've done. I've got a red coming out on the right channel carrying the low voltage AC signal. Now, they're not going to talk to each other or complain because of the same color, but really this should have been done in a different color. It could have been done in white with a little boot of red at each end, which is what I usually do. Anyways, stupid mistake, but I wasn't going to unsolder it. Of course, I saw it just as I finished it. Isn't that always the way? Okay. Now, I'm running a little late because I quickly drew this up this morning. So there's a schematic for the, the dual power supply. We're not going to go over it. It'll take forever. But I'm going to, hopefully next week, I'll put this up on the website. It's, it's drawn slow hand, folks. That's the way I learned in school. And I, I keep trying to use these tube CAD, CAD programs and... I don't know. I've even though I'm quite computer literate, I've never interfaced with CAD. It does, my brain and CAD don't like each other. I don't know what it is. So there's the power supply schematic, and here is the um, the circuit diagram. There's your B plus coming in. This is two halves of the same six or twelve SN seven tube. Now, I've given credit to Reference Audio BV because their work on this inspired this. I've made some changes, so I've taken credit for the mods, and they're all my responsibility, folks. But basically, the, I'm very happy with the performance of the design, and I haven't actually... Normally, I make two, three, four, oh my god, six changes after I build a prototype. And in this case, it just worked perfectly right right from the get-go. So either I got lucky or I'm getting better at doing design work. 
or both, who knows. Anyways, I'm going to put these up on the website. They'll be available for your free download. Use them at your own risk. And it's going to take me uh, at least a few days because I've got to I've got to make a modification into the store so that I can put um, scanned documents into it. But they'll be up there sometime in a week or so. Okay. Enough with that. Let's just put this aside. And you may have noticed these tubes that I'm running in here. See those beautiful things? Let's take a look at. Where have we got them? They're around here somewhere. These tubes are what inspired me to start thinking about 12 volt octals instead of the 6 volt alternative. So, somewhere in here I've got a tube. So, it's fairly unusual these days to find desirable tubes new in the sleeve, NIS, new in the box, NOB, new old stock. Oh yeah. Now if you're opening these vintage boxes, they get fragile. So I always I use these knives, I have them in the store. I use these knives constantly in the shop. That's how you open a vintage box. You get those tabs, get in behind there and flip those tabs open. Let's have a quick look at the box because it's really neat. Date packed 267. So that might be February 67, or it might be the second week of 67, I'm not sure. One electron tube, Jan, so these are mil-spec, Joint Army Navy 12SN7 GTs, manufactured by Sylvania in the U.S. And look at these things, they're just perfect, absolutely perfect. We've got a date code on them. This lettering is, it'll just blow off, it's so so fragile, but this one is 67 one something. So 1967, the etched on 12SN7 is going to stay, but it won't take too many handlings of this tube before this the screen printing is gone. And of course, these are Sylvania's. They've got this angled black T-plate. They're gorgeous sounding tubes. I couldn't believe how beautiful these 12 SN7 sounded. And of course they're testing strong, they're testing balanced. They're just beautiful tubes. Okay, what else came in? You've seen these before. Oh yeah, remember those transformer covers? These things are really neat. They come as an extruded pair and they slide together Extruded pair is really easy for shipping, so it reduces the bulk. Shipping is a huge problem from Asia. And almost everything we use in our tube amp builds is coming in from Asia. So it's a really nice satin brushed aluminum. I have the full size in the store. I also have a half version, and I can even custom mill a, a size in between if you want. And there's a lovely uh, satin brushed aluminum finish as well. And they come with these really nice thick lids. I'm not sure why they gave us such beautiful lids, but they did. And it just takes a 3 mil machine screw into the corners. There's these little corners here that work just perfectly. Anyways, I like these a lot for small builds. The R-Core transformers that I carry just fit. Okay. Oh, one thing I wanted to show you. Or I forget. When I first started building preamps, I didn't put shields in anywhere. And then I started really fighting. I was hunting down all that noise. You know, in your first builds, if it works fine, if it's noisy, who cares? But as time went on, I wanted to build quieter and quieter equipment. So this is my standard box. Black Cherry 3 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths aluminum plate. I love this stuff. It's really sturdy. A little, a little expensive, but I like it. I don't like things flexing. So take a look at this. I came up with the idea of just modifying my existing boxes to take a plate. There's a little gap at the bottom with a little bit of reinforcing on the wire to make sure 
that they don't chafe, and of course the edges are smooth, but I couldn't believe the reduction in noise. That one shield between the sections dropped the noise about 50%. Anyways, that worked out really well. Okay, what else came in this week? Tons and tons of vintage tubes. Have a look at this. This is a 12SN7, a Philco. Well, Philco didn't make tubes. They were, they were equipment manufacturer. You could get really cool radio or console from Philco. So, who made this thing? Well, look at that beautiful big band of waste chrome. Oh, look at those gorgeous black T-plates at right angles to each other. Aha! Uh -huh. That looks like a Sylvania bad boy. And if you can see way, way down, way down at the bottom, there's that little rectangular piece of metal called a foil getter. Ah, that's a Sylvania bad boy. Okay, what else came in? As you know, I'm getting ready for a whole series on the Wilsonton um, integrated tube amplifier. And it takes um, 6SL7s as well as 6SN7s. And I'm going to work on hopefully being able to convert it easily so that it can be switched between a 6 volt heater and a 12 volt heater on the preamp tubes, not on the power tubes. They're running at 6 volts, period. And look at this gorgeous thing. It's a Jan CHS 12SL7 GT by Sylvania. So this is a mil spec. And it's virtually identical to the tube we just looked at, only it's got a much higher gain. And if we look down, it's got a foil getter as well. So those, this is actually what poles look like. They're dirty. There's crud on them. And a big part of what it takes to get them into the store is they have to go through, they go through a, a quick test to see if they're worth spending some time on. If they're testing good, then they have to get cleaned up carefully. Then they get, the pins especially get cleaned up, but the cosmetics have to get cleaned up. Then they get tested for a much longer time on the tester. And then they go, they get documented and they go into the store. Okay. Well, if you stay to the end, here's some discount codes for you. And if anybody's interested, I'll put together a complete parts package for the dual mono uh, preamp. I'll put a nice discount on the package. Just let me know in the comments section below if anyone has any interest, or fire me a message using the store contact option. And if you just need a few parts, basically everything in the build is in the store. And also, hopefully by next week, I'll have those schematics up. So, I have flat rate, $20 shipping around the world. And if you buy $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.